Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast, brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Blogger Genius. Today, my guest is Nicole Culver. Now, Nicole helps women, especially women in the health and wellness industry, grow their businesses. And previously, before this, she had her own food company called Blissful Eats. So welcome to the show, Nicole. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So before we got, so just before we started recording, I had mentioned to you, okay, you have your own food company and you started to talk about it. And I said, wait, wait, let's record it. So, <laughs> yeah. so please tell me like the genesis of how you started blogging and how you built a food company and now how you've transitioned into helping other entrepreneurs. Yeah, so it started just about 10 years ago at this point. I was a fourth grade special ed teacher in New York City, and I was always getting asked about recipes that I made all the time from like friends and family. So I just decided to start a blog, and there was definitely no growth strategy. It was just kind of like diary, here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm making, here's what I'm eating, kind of thing. And as I got more into it, I actually had a big life event where I lost someone really close to me. And I just realized I did not want to be teaching anymore. I didn't want to be counting down the days. I didn't want to be living for weekends and vacations. So I started to plot my escape from teaching. And I knew I needed to do something else because obviously my husband and I relied on my revenue stream or my income from teaching. Now, did, so, wait, did you have kids at this time? I didn't. I okay. didn't. Okay. So yeah, it was just, it was just me and my husband. So I had that luxury of kind of quitting and trying to replace my income, but we could survive on his income. So that was definitely a positive thing for us. I went back to school to become a health coach and I decided to give it a go as a health coach and start a food company. So I gave myself, I got out of teaching at the end of June. I gave myself about six weeks to hit the ground running with a food company and get out into my local community as much as I possibly can and see if this was actually like a feasible a feasible thing that I could do if there was a need if there was a want if there was interest in having a food company and what I saw was there was so I was actually able to quit on August 15th 2011 I called my principal and I quit over the phone which maybe not the best thing to do but that's <laughs> that's how I did it so I I ran Blissful Eats for seven years. So wait, can you years. say how, like what kind of food company and how did you come up with the concept? Oh my gosh, I know it's one of those things that it just feels like it was super easy. So you don't talk about it. Um, I was always making granola. I was always making baked goods for my students, for other colleagues, for friends, family, my husband. So I just decided to start and sell those. So. We, I came up with the name actually from Joseph Campbell's quote, follow your bliss. Mm. Originally it was pure bliss eats, but once we went to trademark it, that wasn't a trademarkable name because someone else actually had that food company. So we went with blissful eats. I changed it pretty quickly. So there wasn't a whole lot of worry about that, even though at that time it felt like, oh my gosh, I have to change my name. How am I ever going to do this? We got over it. We changed our name and it wasn't it wasn't that bad at all. So yeah, it was, it started out as basically all baked goods, which then I quickly realized to have a ton of products, to have a huge product line, very hard to scale down and pick like the one thing that you're, that you're really good at. That is the majority of your sales way, way better. Yes. Way better. Yes. Okay. And so were you baking granola in your kitchen? So I was at first for free, which in New York, we have really, really strict laws. It's different wherever you are in the country. You should just definitely look into it if that's something that you want to do. But you cannot sell products out of, that you make out of your kitchen. Right, so right. what I did was we went around and we made up granola and we just saw if people were interested because you can – you can give it away for free, essentially, if that's if that's what you want to do. But we quickly moved to a commercial kitchen um, in Queens, New York, and baked everything there. We got licenses, we got insured, all the buy the book things because we were really taking it seriously as a business. And how much money did you invest in your business to start to launch it? 
So to start, not that much, probably just whatever the ingredients and the licensing and the the time was. But over the course of the seven years, a lot of money. We were self-funded for seven years. We had done a Kickstarter, so we had raised some money like that. But that's one of the reasons why we actually stopped doing um, Blissful Eats is because while we were making over six figures in revenue, the profit, everything was constantly going back in the business. So I had this coaching and consulting side of my business that was extremely, extremely profitable. And then I had this physical products business that was not profitable at all. Mm -hmm. So I had to basically decide, okay, do I want to spend time with my third baby girl or do I want to keep running myself into the ground in a business that's not profitable? profitable. And I just didn't want to do it anymore, honestly. Right. And what would you say to somebody who has this vision of, I want to make a product and I want to kind of do what you, you know, I'm a baker or whatever. I want to sell some something. What would you say to look out for? Like, cause you were making, you were making revenue, but again, mm-hmm. it was, it sounds like it was like your expenses and investing back into your business was not putting food on your, on your plate. Yeah. So let me first say that no one, um, nothing anyone could have said to me would have changed the course of our business. And actually I had some fantastic advice at the time of my second child when she was born and it definitely changed the path of our business. Um, when I started out, I thought that we would have been a national company. I was really, really wanting to like rise to the top and be one of the most sold granolas and really change the the way that the granola industry was. After years being in the business, I realized that to be a national company, a national brand takes a lot of money and a lot of investment. And that's when I got really good advice from another top, top food company Um, owner of a food company who traveled 48 out of 52 weeks in the year. And she actually didn't have any kids. And she was just like, listen, like if you want to be home with your kids, essentially you can't do both. So you have to pick. And that's when I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for that advice because there's no way I would pick my business over my kids. So we totally switched. We pulled out of Whole Foods at that time. We totally went online and decided that we weren't going to do retail, that we were going to focus on online sales. So my advice to people would be, number one, I get it. I get that you're passionate. And I was the same way. I had that same fire under me. And it's amazing. So definitely use that fire. But do it on your own with your own money for as long as you possibly can and just really target your ideal customers. Because if you can sell direct to customers, your revenue and your profit Your profit margins are going to be way higher than if you need to bring in all sorts of distributors and food brokers and um, supermarkets, things like that. So I would sell direct as long as you possibly can and really hone in on your messaging and getting to know your clients and figuring out what they really want before you expand in a bigger way. Got it. Now, how was so when did you shut this down? Uh, February. Oh, wow. And how was that emotionally and all of that. What was that like? Emotionally, it was super hard. And I've been super transparent with my membership, um, my blogger to business group about it, because it was something that was looming. It was something that we knew we should have done um, probably a year. Actually, in February 2017, my husband and I sat down and we were like, we're going to give this one more year. We're going to see how this goes. But quite honestly, the entire last year, every time we would work on that side of the business, because it really was running on autopilot, um, we would get a huge pit in our stomach and we would be like, oh my gosh. And he'd be like, like, okay, let's work on Blissful Eats. And I'd be like, let's not work on Blissful Eats. <laughs> so it was something we should have done way sooner, but fear was holding us back. And also that was our identity for seven years. We, yes. Our family yes. knew us as a granola company, our friends. We had made a name for ourselves in our community. And right. it was really hard to disassociate ourselves from that and to be like, oh, actually we shut down, but this is a really good thing for us because- yes. 
people think like you shut down, something must have went wrong. And we were like, no, everything actually like this is so right. So that was hard. And it was hard to explain even to like my in-laws. They didn't really understand now what we were doing. Right when we shifted away from blissful eat. So it was really hard. It was really emotional. It was something we should have done way, way sooner, but we weren't ready. And it took us that big change of literally like my February 28th due date, um, which my daughter didn't actually end up coming until a week later than that. But it was like, okay, we need to tell people because I, I can't continue to live. Like it felt like almost like a fake life at that point. Interesting. Because I would say we have our, our original business is called Catch My Party. And when people ask me, like, what are the biggest mistakes you've made with Catch My Party? I would say not pivoting faster when mm-hmm. something wasn't working. Kind of saying, no, 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 it could work. And we could make this, you know, so we opened a store on Catch My Party. It was a white label store. Another party supplier was, um, you know, it was their products. But we were selling them and we're like, duh, no brainer. We're a party ideas site. This should work. And so we kept at it. And in hindsight, the writing was on the wall. It didn't Mm -hmm. connect. We weren't getting sales. Um, and we were, but not like we thought we would. And again, I think it was like, we felt like we could fix this. We could solve it. We'll give it more time. And then ultimately we had to pivot and say, nope, this isn't working. And, and then afterwards there was tremendous relief. Yeah, so much. (laughs) Almost like we put down this heavy weight, but we were so stuck in our thinking and again, same idea, like, of course we should have a party. Like people know, like it, it just made sense for us. And we were known as that and we were growing. And um, so I would say that that for us was our biggest, that like, cost us a lot of money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, same. So I, and so was your husband working with you on Blissful Eats or has he always had his own career? So my husband left, I think this is his three year anniversary of uh, quitting his job in New York City. He was like a financial planner for um, some construction companies, actually. So he had a traditional job. And three years ago in August, he put in his two weeks notice and quit his job to work more with Blissful Eats. And he did take on some um, some other clients on the side for financial planning and to help him because Blissful Eats, like we said, it hadn't been making profit. So he basically split his week between working with Blissful Eats and working with other clients. But he has been along for the ride for the past three years, basically. And how has it been for your marriage, letting go of Blissful Eats? Oh my gosh, so much better. There was so much stress and it got to the point where it was like, okay, should we pack orders ourselves, or should I do consults for my coaching and consulting business? And when I tell you it was like penny, like not even getting paid because the profit wasn't there, but it was just like, you get a $20 order of granola or a $40 order of granola. And then you have to print the labels. You have to pack the boxes. You have to send them out or put them out on the stoop for USPS. The amount of time and energy it took was just insane comparatively to the coaching and consulting. So when we let that go, it was just a huge, huge weight off our shoulders. I bet. I bet. I mean, again, I work with my husband, so everything gets kind of intertwined Mm -hmm. and that can be such a positive. And though when things are not going well or you have to make those hard choices, you can't, um, at least, you know, you can't really separate it because it's your life. Yes, 100%. And it was something that we both knew should happen, but neither one of us wanted to say it to the other person. So it was unspoken. And I'm sure my husband felt like he didn't want to say it to me because it was like my business baby. It was my idea. It was my vision. So he, I'm sure, I'm sure wanted to say it a million times. I actually haven't even ever asked him that. Um, I'm sure he wanted to say it a million times to me. And I wanted to say it a million times to him, but it was like such a crutch for us that we just kept trying to bang our heads against the wall and make it work. Right. 
Now tell me then about the coaching business. So how did that start? Well, again, so your thing is we are a granola company, right? Mm -hmm. We we are going to sell our granola all over the world and like be that. And then where did coaching and helping other entrepreneurs, how did that show up for you? So I wanted, I needed another outlet essentially because we had this business, but I needed something else to do with my time. Essentially, I had my second daughter in 2015 and after my husband quit his job, I just actually had some extra time. I don't know how, but I actually started podcasting and with podcasting, I started getting questions about how we grew our food business and we had gotten into Whole Foods. We had gotten in Thrive Market. We had gotten on Amazon. So we had been doing Facebook ads. So people just started asking us questions. How did you grow? How are you getting customers? How are you honing in on um, selling? How are you doing Facebook ads? So I started talking about it on my podcast and I started interviewing other women in the food and wellness industry on my podcast. So I saw there was a need. My podcast had grown pretty quickly. I was doing three episodes a week. I was, yeah, I was, I did that for just about a year and then I went to two and then I took a break. So we, and is your just, po- is your podcast still going? It's not right now. It's okay. not. Okay. But if people want to go check out your older, yes, it's older still there. what is it? It's called Blissful Bites. Okay. Got it. Um, so I just started getting more questions. So actually, I took all the people that I interviewed on my podcast and friends I had made through blogging, and I just said, hey, would you want to do a virtual summit? And I had 23 people who were like, yeah. Okay, wait, can you, sorry, can you explain what a virtual summit is? It's basically um, online, it was an online masterclass. It was a series of online masterclasses. So basically it was a video, it was around 30 to 45 minutes long and it was around all different subjects to grow your online business essentially. But I wasn't super comfortable being the center of that, but I was super comfortable interviewing my friends and asking them questions. So that's where the summit idea came from. So in May, 2016, I put out my first virtual summit and I actually charged for it something super low. It was like $57 for early bird. And then I think it went up to like $75 after that. Um, And I sold like a hundred, I should know this number, but it was like 150 tickets. We ended up doing like a little over $11,000 in sales and $8,000 in profit. And when (laughs) when we did that, I was like, I've never made this much profit at once before. What is going on here? This is something. I'm on to something. Right, and it's a virtual product, which is very different from something that you make in a in a in a factory in a kitchen and have to ship out out. Yes, right. And it was only about. It only cost me $3,000. So it was $11,000 in revenue, $8,000. I think it was even a little higher than $8,000 in profit. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am on to something here. And that was, I mean, it was not straight up. I don't want to make it seem like, oh, there were no child, there were no struggles, no challenges. I just got sales. But it was, it's a squiggly road, but I knew I had something there. Yep. Yeah, and again, it, it's so interesting because, um, again, for us, like when we opened this uh, party store on Catch My Party, it was like we launched it and there were crickets, meaning we just weren't getting sales. Mm-hmm. Like a couple sales would come in and we'd be like, see, this is going to work. But then there have been other things that we've done, like we pulled in products from Etsy and we get affiliate uh, revenue from Etsy and boom, all of a sudden we turned yeah. that on and there were sales. And it was like, oh, this is like, so when something works, it kind of works. Yes, totally. And and like the idea of banging your head against the wall is like, like notice if there is something in your business and you're banging your head against the wall and you are not making money, go a different direction. Yes, totally. And it's so important to 
be fluid and flexible. And I talk a lot about this in my, in my membership, my blogger to business group, because so many people get hung up on like a, what's my five-year vision. And that's great. But when I do my five-year vision, I write down what I want my day to look like, how I want to feel. Because if I, five years ago, I was dead set on growing my granola business. And if I wasn't fluid and flexible and reflective, then I would still be banging my head against the wall and worried on, I need to get to my five-year vision. But instead, my five-year vision was like working with my husband, dropping my kids off from school, being able to take off when they need me to, being around for my kids. It was around those things, not getting Bliss Elites to be a national company, which is what I thought it would have been, but it's changed so many times over since then. And if I was so rigid, I never would have been open to shutting it down. I love that. I love that. In fact, somebody said this to me, which is that in order to not have like a midlife crisis, the solution is micro adjustments. Yes, yes. That you don't all of a sudden wake up one day and go like, what the hell, what is my life? Like, this is not the life I wanted, but that you're constantly evaluating. Does this feel right? Is this working? Am I making money? Does this fit with my kids and where they are, my husband? And if it's not, do a micro adjustment. Try something new. Yes, it's so true. And this was even... I actually held a retreat over the weekend with my husband, and that was one of the things that we talked about just because we had some people who just weren't, they were stressing and they were working all the time. And we just talked about if you don't fix it now, it's not going to take that much to fix it now. It's not going to take that much to spend a half hour with your husband or to spend a half hour with someone you really love. But in five years from now, in 10 years from now, that wedge is going to be way bigger and it's going to be so much harder to fix. So just do it now. So you're not saying like, I wish I worked less in five years from now. I so agree. I so agree. Okay. So let's go back. You all of a sudden, boom, are make, you made $8,000 in profit and you think to yourself, what? I thought to myself, how do I continue this? How do I continue (laughs) to build the momentum? And I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, the first thing I did after that first summit was I did a masterclass series, which went okay. I think we sold like under 20, but above 10, I'll say it was like 15 where it was just one different, one different expert call a month for three months. And it got us through basically through the summer. I don't even remember how much I charged for it, but I know it wasn't much, maybe like a hundred bucks. Um, but again, I was like, okay, people bought this. This is super cool. And then from there in September, 2016, so it'll be two years, um, next month, And we launched actually a membership site for $19. I had 20 people purchase it and I've been doing that ever since. So what does your membership site give you? So again, like evolution, um, when it, when it started those people, I have probably 15 of those people still with me now, which is so amazing. That's amazing. Um, They're my original original people and I love them still. Um, so now what you get when you sign up for the membership is you get a monthly download. So it's like a monthly guidebook, we call it. So that has all different, all different topics. We actually are working on confidence this month. We have worked on profit. We've worked on growing your audience. We've worked on mindset. But what I'm actually noticing more and more as I'm always in the group trying to get to know people better is that the number one thing, and I don't know if this is a women thing because my group is 100% women, we need to work on is our confidence in our Mm. business. So we've been not transitioning. I don't want to say transitioning because I have content on email marketing, on growing your Instagram, on growing your Pinterest. I have all that content. But what I'm finding is the Facebook group alone and the support in the Facebook group is worth the price of the membership. And that is what I'm hearing over and over again. So even, I don't know how many people use the playbooks. I think the more aligned they are with emotional issues, the more people use them actually, because I think people just kind of need 
use the content as they go, but everyone needs help with content, confidence. Everyone needs help with mindset. So it's really, really interesting. But the, the basically it's, it's a guidebook a month. There's a whole, um, a whole membership portal on growing your business. But the two main things are the guidebook, the accountability, and the Facebook group. And it's a private Facebook group. You get it's into a private, the Facebook group by yes, joining the mm-hmm. born by being a member. Exactly. So when you sign up, you get you actually get a quiz, and it levels you at what stage of business you are in, and tells okay. you, okay, I need to work on if I'm at the grow your audience phase. I need to work here is what I need to work on. I need to grow my audience. I need to get to know them. And here are videos that go along with it. So that's the first thing. But then you get into the group and it's really like that support that you need. Like the, I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm not doing this alone support. Right. Right. I I will just say in terms of the confidence thing, one thing that I am paying attention to in my own life is how often I apologize. Oh my gosh. We have been having this conversation in there so much. And just something dumb like this, which is my husband, who is lovely, he's like a wonderful partner in every way, does a lot of the grocery shopping because he does a lot. He's like a a cook, you know, chef or whatever. He loves to cook. So one day I had said to him, I put on the list cottage cheese. And he comes back from the grocery store and I say, oh, where's the cottage cheese? And he says, oh, I forgot. And I go, oh, and I'm weirdly waiting for him to say, I'm really sorry that I forgot your cottage cheese. It's something dumb. But I I thought about it and I thought, had it been reversed and he had wanted cottage cheese, um, I would have come home and gone, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I totally forgot your cottage cheese. And I I could go back to the grocery store and get you, if it's really important to you, I could get cottage cheese for you. Oh my God, I don't know why. I would have gone through the whole story of being in the dairy aisle. And to him, like he's a good guy. So he was just like, oh yeah, I forgot. He didn't even say I'll get it for you next time. But he just was like totally fine. But I mean, he, I'm sure on some level felt like, oh, I messed up, but he didn't say it. He didn't right. apologize. And I said to him, I go, wow, that's so fascinating. You did not apologize for forgetting my cottage cheese. And had that been reversed, my, I would have been up in my head even afterwards going, I can't believe I forgot his cottage cheese. Oh my gosh. I think has, I've totally had, I've been there a hundred percent, probably had the same conversation. It's so true. It's so true. So and I that's thought, every, yeah, yeah, that's everything from like work emails to being like, I'm so sorry. It took me 10 minutes to get back to you or 20 minutes or 24 hours. It's just so innate to us to just apologize. Absolutely. So I have tried to in my life challenge myself to when I like to when I catch myself I'm sure nine times out of ten I don't but when there is that opportunity that I catch myself I will go don't say it don't mm-hmm. say it just see what happens if you don't apologize and also I have a daughter who's 11 and she will apologize and my husband and I both will go no apologies mm-hmm. no apologies so anyway that is just one place where I think Like I, so the cottage cheese thing, like I would have spent so much mental energy in my head, like wasted time uh, going through that whole thing of I'm a bad girl and, you know, without even knowing I'm doing it. Right. It's so true. And I think probably everyone listening to this right now is nodding their head. Yes. So if there is a moment when you can catch yourself and not apologize, see what happens. You know, and in, you know, and, and go ahead, like in your head, apologize like crazy, but try not to say it. See what happens. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. And actually someone in my group was just saying when she catches herself in email apologizing, she's just deleting it and just saying like, okay, I'm deleting this. I'm not apologizing. Yes. Yes. So that is just so anyway, I, I feel like that is something that especially as women, we do. Because we want to be nice and we want to please and we want to take care. And that's wonder. Like those are, that's what makes women great. But in business, it's also something where it undercuts us. Yeah, it totally does. It totally does. And it also, I think, forces us to put other people before ourselves as well. Definitely. I wanted to take a short break and share about this cool new thing we've added at Milo Tree. So now you can add an image to your email pop-up 
This way, if you are offering a course or a, an ebook or a free download, just add an image of it into your pop-up so people know exactly what they're getting and they're more enticed. And remember, you can grow Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, all from your one account on MiloTree. So head over to MiloTree.com, sign up now, you get your first 30 days free, so there's really no risk. And back to the show. So, okay, so so what's interesting, what you're saying is that in your group, you found that it is people need to learn how to grow their email list, but there are these like fundamental things. Yes, there's there are these important issues that I think are just blocking them from getting any further because they're not confident in what they're offering. And my group of people, which I'm sure is similar to the people who are listening, but they are so talented yes. and they are so amazing at what they do, but they can't stand in it because they have so much imposter syndrome and they are so kind of caught up with what how the next person is better than them yes. when they are so, so talented themselves. So we're really just working on standing in our magic and leveraging that to just be better business owners. But the confidence is like that first step. So in your Facebook group, how do people support each other? Oh my gosh, in so many ways. I wish I could even, and I know kind of every, probably everyone feels this way about their Facebook group, but I seriously have the most supportive women in my group who are just willing to put themselves out there to share their stories of vulnerability, to share their stories of, of what they've been through and they just connect and support each other. And they're, they're so open with their growth. If they've done something that's working, they'll come to the group and share it with them. There's no feeling of like, you're going to steal my success. It's yes. we, that yes. rising tides lifts all ships or lifts yep. all boats, whatever that quote is. I always butcher those, but we can all do this. We can all have success. We don't need to worry that you're going to steal my my business, my clients, my Instagram followers. We can all do this together. Yes. It's funny. Uh, I've had other guests on the podcast and we've talked about working with each other to help each other. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at its highest place, that is incredibly powerful. You know, like small women entrepreneurs helping other entrepreneurs, whether it be with sharing content with each other or being in Facebook share groups or all of that stuff. Like when it's working, it is magic. It is How magic. However, there is also an underbelly to it, which is it's hard not to compare yourself. It's hard to not, again, because we're women and we're very active in our own heads, to create stories that might not be true of like, oh, she slighted me. Well, did she? I don't know, but I can create a whole story about it. Mm -hmm. Or or she's doing, her life is so much better than my life. Or who knows what it is. But as women, we also, there can be a pettiness or there can be a competitiveness. And especially because we're women and we want to please, we're not as willing to confront and say, hey, did you mean, like I thought, did you mean this? Is this you know, this is how I read this. Is this true or what? We all kind of want to make nice. But because we're all sitting here at our own computers, in our own little spaces, we can create narratives that can be really destructive, even if it's not true. Yes, we totally can. Honestly, I I don't know how, but I don't see that in my group at all. I don't know how. I literally don't know how I created this culture and I've attracted amazing people who don't undercut each other, but I, I've seen it and I, I've definitely seen it firsthand. Um, and it is, it is the story, you know, the stories we tell ourselves can go on forever, I think. Yes. And I was listening to a podcast and it was saying that like an idle mind is an unhappy mind. Meaning a lot of times if you let your mind wander, it will go into uh, painful places whether it be feelings of inadequacy, problems, whatever. And so just to be mindful that just uh, like when we start to create stories, a lot of times they're not always positive. Yes. So just to of, know that as a pattern. Yes, that's so important. And one of the best things I've heard, and I wish I could remember where I heard this, but it was talking about just like we compare ourselves. But 
if we really want to compare ourselves, if you really want to compare yourself to me, then compare where I was, where you are. So if you're six months into your business, then let's go back and look at what my life was like six months into running my granola business. You can't compare someone's chapter one to someone else's chapter 12. So let's compare the real the real things here and that will give you some type of idea because a lot of times people want to compare what I'm doing to what they're doing when they've just started or they want to compare having one child to three working with three children and what I'll tell them is when I had one child I was a full-time mom I didn't have my husband on my team full-time I didn't have I had I didn't have all the things that I have now so actually I'll be super honest having one child was a heck of a lot harder than having mm. three children is. Mm. Absolutely. I think that is so powerful. I think that is really true. And also to know um, that my, that, you know, somebody's life on Instagram is not their real life. I mean, you know? yes, no way. So we see these beautiful photos and it looks so magical. And to, to continue to remind yourself that that's not real life. And I think it's important too, if you are be feeling like that, like if, if, if it's making you feel bad, then just, it's okay to unfollow. It's okay to shut down. It's okay to delete the app for a little bit. It doesn't mean you'll never go back to them, but you need to curate your space and make the people you follow really inspirational and make you feel good. If someone someone's content is making you feel bad over and over again, it's okay to just wish them well and hit the <laughs> unfollow button. I like that. Yes. So let's, so, okay. So who is the ideal person to join your group? So I mainly work with wellness entrepreneurs. So that is the registered dietitians or the food bloggers, the food photographers, the recipe developers. That's the majority of my business or like the health coaches. Um, but I also have those business outliers who are like, SEO experts or book writers who are in my group who just really want a community and a business support. So my main my main people are in the food and wellness industry who are bloggers and influencers who really want to grow their business in a way that we don't need to just focus on page views and followers, but we can focus on connection and relationship and engagement over all those numbers. That's cool. That's great. And then, uh, so every month you're creating content for your group. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what is your now, now you've got three kids mm -hmm. and is your husband working with you on this part of your business? Yeah. So this is mainly what we work on. We take on an extremely limited amount of one-on-one -on -one clients and then we have some small group. We just launched a inner circle after our retreat and we have our membership. So th those are kind of like the three tiers to our business. But yes, he is with me. Um, we juggle the kids and we juggle the business. Got it. Okay. And so what is your, how many hours a week are you working on your business? Right now, barely any because wow, I'm that's amazing. between summer camp and school, which is a really weird, very hard time of year where we have very little structure and it's not doing us any good. I'll tell you that. <laughs> what do you mean? Because um, just our kids are just, it's, it's hard, lack of routine. So we're kind of trying to work it between the crazy, between the beach trips. Um, usually during the school year, I work anywhere from 30, I would say average of 30 hours a week while my kids are in school. Okay. And, and wait, and you have a baby, right? Or one? Yeah. Oh she's, my God. Um, she'll be six months old and so, she's oh like my God. the best baby ever. So it's made the transition very easy. She sleeps really well. She eats really well. So she's just a little angel baby. So she hasn't added too much, um, dynamic to the group. So that's a good thing. <laughs> that is terrific. Now, do you have a team? Like, do you have VAs and people helping you? So I have a freelancer who helps me with video work and formatting for my content. And then 
I have my husband and it's just the two of us right now, but it's a really big deal to have someone working with you full time. So while we don't have a team, I don't want to discount that because I know a lot of people are like, how does she do it by her, by herself? But really I have someone working like 30 to 40 hours with me. Who's my right hand man, who I don't have to manage, who I don't have to explain things to in detail. So that is my team and it's basically like having another one of me i'll tell you so it is it is a lot of help right and what are you experimenting with now to grow your business like what where do you see it going my what i or what ideas are you going like oh we could try that so we are actually doing our first big three-part video series in a few weeks which we have never done before i've always done Every December, I do this big planning party where I take a really big group of people, um, like 2,000 people. Hopefully this year it'll be even bigger, but I take like around 2,000 people through planning out what their next year will be like. So I do that as like a big launch, and I was doing summits up until January. But in January, I decided that my focus was going to be my membership group, and I was going all in on my membership group. So Now I'm actually doing this video series called The Social Shift, which is the new way to grow your influencer and blog business that has nothing to do with counting page views or followers. So this is the first time we're doing this pre-recorded video series that is going to be really, really big, which I'm really excited for. And that is going to lead into the opening of our blogger to business group, the membership group. Got it. Okay. So you open your group one time a year? It's twice a year, and then we have a wait list. Okay, got it. And so the way that you attract people to it is you offer this, now you're gonna offer a video series and say, come do this video series, and then if you like this at the end, you can join our group. Exactly, So, exactly. Uh, So everybody could see this video series. Everybody can see the video series, and I really hope that a lot of people join us because it is a huge opportunity. And whether you join the blogger to business group or not being a part of this social shift, the new way of doing your influencer business is a huge opportunity for everyone. So even if you don't come join us for the blogger to business group, you're going to want to join us for the video series because you'll still learn what to do. You just will be doing it on your own and that's okay too. Right. Okay. And so are you having a crew come in and is this like a big production? Oh my gosh. No. Okay. So right now at this point in my, in my crazy life, I love simplicity and I'm always like doing, I heard this on Amy Porterfield's podcast with Brooke Castillo, B minus work. So I love that is awesome but it was just shot in my backyard with a tripod against my white fence which made a really fantastic background and it's super simple my freelance video editor has edited it but it was just me and my husband doing it with my kids coming out like nine million times what like what are you doing out here (laughs) why do you have the video camera set up so super simple but that's how i i try and keep everything simple because i just can't do the big production now I love that. Again, I think that is, you know, that that expression, done is better than perfect. Yes, it is. It It really is. If you want to move your business forward and live your life, and especially if you have children, like write that mantra on, like put it on your fridge. Yes. And, you know, at one point, I'm sure I will do the production thing. But at this time, in the time frame I needed to get it done, it just, I did buy a teleprompter though. So that was Ooh, that's cool. Big deal. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> but um, that's as big as, as big as we went for this and it's going to be perfect. I was actually going to do it as Facebook lives, but I didn't feel like it would have done the content justice. So I did go to the pre recorded. And then do you run ads like on Facebook and that kind of thing so people hear about it? Yeah. So we are big Facebook ads proponents. We that was another thing. When you have when you grow your business, you have two things. You you can have time or you can use money. And yep. we used money to get the 
the majority of growth in our business. We did use affiliates, but honestly, we've spent a lot of money on Facebook ads in the past seven years. And it's been a lot of learning, but it's been amazing because I can do things like just put on a Facebook ad and grow my email list consistently rather than worrying about SEO and blogging and doing all these other things. So again, simplicity and focus and Facebook ads, while I'm sure Facebook ads won't always be the thing that we use in the next five years to grow our business. It's what we've leveraged in the past five years, and it's been very good to us. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, Nicole, if people want to reach out to you or learn more about you, uh, what is the best way? The best way is to come over to my Facebook page or my Facebook group. If you just search Nicole Culver on Facebook, you will find it, or you can get the behind the scenes, which I say behind the scenes because I am not, I, Facebook is my main platform for business. Instagram is my for fun platform. It's just Nicole Culver over there, but you're not going to get much business content. I'll be honest. You're going to get more of my kids and my everyday life over there. So if you want the business stuff, if you want to learn how to grow your audience and do so in a way that doesn't involve page views or your follower account, then just search Nicole Culver on Facebook and you'll get my Facebook page. So come and follow me over there. And that's how then people could learn about joining your membership. Yes, yes, definitely. And that is the social shift. It's coming and it's going to be all on my Facebook page. So my Facebook page name is just Nicole Culver. So you'll see it all over there. Awesome. Well, honestly, this has been such a delight. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was so much fun chatting with you. Are you trying to grow your social media followers and email subscribers? Well, if you've got two minutes, I've got a product for you. It's Milo Tree. Milo Tree is a smart pop up slider that you install on your site and it pops up and asks your visitors to follow you on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, or subscribe to your list. It takes two minutes to install. We offer a WordPress plugin or a simple line of code, and it's Google friendly on mobile and desktop. So we know where your traffic is coming from. We show a Google-friendly pop-up on desktop and a smaller Google-friendly pop-up on mobile. Check it out. Sign up today and get your first 30 days free. 